New York State Racing Hair Mutual Wagering and Breeding Office 102 provides that the New York State Gaming Commission shall consist of seven members appointed by the governor by and with the consent of the Senate. Six members having been confirmed by the New York State Senate affords the commission an ability to establish a quorum and undertake action. This present meeting of the commission is now called to order. Ms. Secretary, will you please call the roll? John Crotty. Mark Aaron. Present. Peter Machetti. Here. John Bethlemba. Here. Barry Sample. Here. Todd Snyder. Here. The Secretary, please let the record reflect that a quorum of qualified members are present, thus enabling the transaction of business. Please also let the record reflect that the Chairman Guerin is in Geneva, and bilateral audio and visual communications have been established between the two meeting locations. Chairman Guerin? Great. Thank you, Rob, and thank you for the accommodation to, to remain here given the weather forecast. Um, we have a fulsome agenda, so why don't we... Why don't we begin with the minutes of the commission meetings uh, conducted on December 22nd, 2014. They've been provided to members in advance, and at this time I'd like to ask the members if there are any edits or corrections or amendments. Mr. Chairman, um, it's Todd Snyder. I would just ask that um, somebody on the uh, staff take a look at uh, item number three and just make sure that it's it's. It's legible. I'm not a thousand percent sure exactly what's being said in number three. If we just write it in a way that's clearer, I'd be happy with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Anything else for the minutes? Madam Secretary, please let the record reflect um, that with Mr. Snyder's uh, guidance uh, that they were uh, adopted as, as amended and circulated. Uh, next, we turn to the executive director's report. Rob. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to discuss four items today. First, to briefly discuss the recent meeting of the Gaming Facility Allocation Board. Second, to apprise you of some issues related to equine breakdowns at Aqueduct Racetrack. Third, to advise regarding commission duties and responsibilities relative to video lottery gaming facility establishment in Nassau and Suffolk counties. And finally, to discuss the establishment of three regulatory work groups regarding commercial casino gambling. First, the Gaming Facility Location Board conducted a meeting on January 13th at which they provided a status on the final report and recommendation and considered Governor Cuomo's letter request that the board consider a new request for applications limited to Zone 2, Region 5. In short, the board indicated that they were still working their way through various revisions and indicated that the anticipated release date of the final report would be by the end of the month. They also unanimously agreed to consider a new request for applications limited to Zone 2, Region 5, pending commission review. To that end, they requested staff prepare a request for applications for their consideration at a later date. Uh, they have not scheduled a, at their next meeting yet, by the way. They strongly stated that their consideration of Region 5 was appropriate and consistent with their announced preliminary findings and recommendations in that the southern portion of the region contained a market that would not, with the potential addition of another gaming facility, economically conflict with the recommended projects. They were also somewhat disturbed by the mischaracterization that the region was again being considered simply due to poor economic factors a representation that had been made by proponents of gaming facilities for the city of Newburgh. Relative to horse breakdowns at Aqueduct, since the winter move to the Aqueduct race course, Naira has experienced a spate of breakdowns. The frequency of occurrence is alarming, causing all racing participants to reflect back to 2011-2012 when Naira faced a similar rash of catastrophic injuries. The 2011-2012 or 2011 incidents, of course, led to the establishment of the Task Force on Equine Health and Safety. The rate of fatalities at this present aqueduct meet actually exceed the rate during those years. Staff is gravely concerned with the number of incidents and is thoroughly investigating the circumstances of each fatality so that the Commission can best address the situation. Understanding the causal root of the breakdowns is primary to a measured and appropriate reaction. To that end, 
State Equine Medical Director, Dr. Scott Palmer, has been coordinating a comprehensive review of each equine fatality, whether occurring during racing or during training. These reviews include necropsy reports, which didn't exist prior to 2012, in an effort to identify the cause of injury and help identify factors that may have led to such occurrence. Dr. Palmer has always mandated, has also mandated that any horse that dies on the grounds of aqueduct, whether racing or not, be sent to Cornell for necropsy. A few of the causes are evident. In one instance, necropsy identified a coronary blood vessel anomaly that had never been reported before in horses, but was associated with human exercise fatality. In another, a fatigued horse stepped poorly on its front leg, landed badly but with no fracture, tripped, collapsed, and drove his head into the racetrack, breaking his neck. Several were precipitated, at least in part, by apparent jockey action. Many, however, simply experienced unexplained catastrophic limb fractures. In 2011-2012, many of the deaths were attributed to purse-to-claim ratios that incentivized racing horses with potential health problems. This was promptly addressed. The task force also identified structural issues within the racing operations that were addressed by Naira. Additionally, the task force identified factors that were present in many of the catastrophically injured horses. Research regarding factor identification continues. The Office of Veterinary Affairs is undertaking a matched case controlled study seeking to identify high risk horses before they race. Statistical analysis is underway and a consultation will be made with a Cornell University epidemiologist. Naira shares the concern with the breakdown trend as well. They engaged the, surface, the services of renowned track surface expert Dr. Michael Patterson, the executive director of research, Racing Surfaces Testing Laboratory at the University of Maine to examine the surface of the inner track in an attempt to identify issues with the physical track. Dr. Peterson has examined the track on four separate occasions since the start of the meet and has found no present abnormalities. Additionally, Naira veterinarians who are attending have full and independent authority to scratch horses at any time for any reason. They have identified 22 non-competitive horses and have barred them from participation. This aggressive review is a necessary component in protecting the equine athlete. Naira also announced that they are keeping a poor performance list. Horses placed on this list after performing in a race at Aqueduct and losing by a margin of 25 lengths or greater would be placed on the list. Once on the list, the horse must complete a half a mile workout in 53 seconds or less to be permitted to race at a future date. Naira has also reduced weekday race cards to eight races and raised the bottom level for maiden claimers from $12,500 to $16,000. I'm sorry, $12,500. And not accepting entries at Aqueduct for any horse that has not participated in a recognized race within 14 days of that last start. Finally, the operations of the Equine Safety Review Board have also been restructured to help improve its function. The Equine Medical Director will now schedule and run weekly meetings. These meetings will include the Equine Medical Director, the Naira Safety Steward, the Naira Chief Examining Veterinarian, and the Vice President of Racing uh, Surfaces. The pathology report process will be expedited for gross pathology reports to be available for rapid review. Following meetings and depending upon outcome, the equine medical director and Naira safety steward will meet with the trainer of the affected horse to discuss findings. Finally, results from the ESRB analysis will be reviewed and summarized on a regular basis so as to assist development policy recommendations to both the commission and to Naira. Since the initial meeting of the gaming commission, we have stressed our role in ensuring equine health and safety is a primary concern and there should be no doubt that our concerns remain primary. For those of you who reside either locally or read the Long Island newspapers, you may be aware that the Nassau and Suffolk Regional Off-Track Betting Corporations have each identified locations where they want to site their video lottery gaming facility. If you recall, in 2013, the legislature authorized each of the Off-Track Betting Corporations 
to open a video lottery gaming facility in its respective region. Nassau has identified a proposed location, the Fortune Off Mall, former Fortune Off Mall in Westbury. Suffolk has identified a site in Medford near the Long Island Expressway, exit 64. There has been widespread media coverage regarding the proposed development, and as might be expected, not all of the reporting has been accurate. The commission has been portrayed by many as either having made the decision to locate the facilities at the Westbury or Medford sites, or alternatively has final approval authority over the site selection itself. By law, the loan restriction in each respective off-track betting corporation siting of the facility is that it must be located in a facility authorized pursuant to sections 1008 or 1009 of the Race and Parent Mutual Wagering and Breeding Law. It functionally means that the facilities must be located either at an off-track betting branch office or within a simulcast theater. NASA is statutory limited to, or has, has already created their, their simulcast theater and uh, has that established at the Race Palace at Plainview, so they will necessarily be limited to locating their uh, branch office, uh, or a branch office at the gaming facility. The commission standard of review for the branch offices has been historically limited to a few different specifics, generally relative to the lease document, review of personal history disclosure forms, examination of feasibility studies to ensure that the facility will generate incremental revenue to the regional corporations, and examination of various certificates of occupancy. Uh, we also have some, some level of uh, approvals relative to each branch as well that are similarly situated. But the law is clear that we don't have a role in the selection of locations for either NASA or Suffolk's proposed video lottery gaming facility itself. Those decisions on location are wholly and completely vested each, with each individual corporation, which are public benefit corporations with boards of directors selected by their respective county legislatures. As to the work group announcement, I previously discussed work groups and commission staff has been contemplating the development of regulations necessary to govern the new casino gambling industry. To that end, staff has developed a framework, a table of contents for the regulatory scheme. But rather than springing a cumulative set of proposed rules on the industry, we've determined to develop rules through a measured process by bringing topics into manageable portions and establishing informal working groups of interested parties to assist in hone staff produced product. Conceptually, the, the staff would take a first pass at the proposed set of rules, circulate the same to members of the topical working group, meet with the working group if needed to develop a better product, and then bring it to the commission for formal rule proposal, at which time the standard State Administrative Procedures Act requirements would apply. Today, we're going to announce the, the, or we're announcing the formation of the first three rulemaking working groups. The first work group regards problem gambling. The gaming law contains several specific requirements regarding prevention and outreach programs and controls on certain advertising. We're seeking industry stakeholders and some interested groups and individuals and other concerned parties that would help with the refinement of draft regulations to govern that area. We also intend a specific outreach to disabled communities to ensure that there's an inclusive environment established that allows for all customers to enjoy the full spectrum of amenities offered by the destination gaming resorts. So again, we're looking for industry stakeholders and interested parties to weigh in on the issue of access and utilization of commercial casinos by persons with disabilities. Finally, one of the statutory factors for review of bidder applicants for the casino licenses was the implementation of workforce development plans that, among other things, incorporated an affirmative action program of equal opportunity at which the licensee guaranteed to provide equal employment opportunities to all employees qualified for licensure. The development of workforce training programs that serve the underemployed and ensured accessibility of employment to gaming facilities and the establishment, funding, and maintenance of human resources hiring and training practices that promote the development of a skilled and diverse workforce. To that end, we are likewise seeking to engage industry stakeholders, interested groups, and individuals to uh, assist with the development and refinement of workplace diversity regulations. 
no later than wednesday at the close of business we will probably post information on the commission's web page as to how to volunteer for these work groups we will also be contacting those who have previously indicated their interest in assisting in these endeavors chair great thank you rob that was a fulsome report I appreciate your your work in the establishment especially of the work group on uh, problem gambling and look forward to that report as well as your update from and report from the uh, gaming facilities location board and we look to future updates uh, from you as as events allow for so thank you for that uh, the New York State racing paramutual wagering and breeding law section 105 4.19 authorizes the Commission to promulgate rules and regulations that it deems necessary to carry out its responsibilities to that end, the Commission will from time to time promulgate rules and amendments uh, pursuant to the State Administrative Procedure Act. And today we have two rulemaking items uh, for consideration. So let me ask Rob to outline the proposals. Item 4A regards rules pertaining to gaming facility requests for application, gaming facility license application. Specifically, on March 31st, 2014, the Commission promulgated emergency rules prescribing both forms for the request of application to develop and operate a gaming facility and several forms necessary to consider the and process applications for gaming facility licenses. By publication in the State Register on July 16th, September 10th, November 12th, and now January 7th, the Commission extended emergency adoption. The present emergency rule will expire on February 16th, 2015. Accordingly, for Commission consideration is the readoption of Part 5300 as an emergency rule with such readoption to be filed with the Department of State prior to the expiration of the current emergency rule. The text of the rules have not changed since the initial emergency adoption on March 31st, 2014. While the public comment period has expired and no public comment was received, permanent adoption of this rule should be considered when the Commission has before it a broader set of commercial proposed commercial casino regulations that are still, as I mentioned, being drafted. Commission staff recommends readoption of this emergency rulemaking. So any questions from commissioners on the uh, readoption of the rules pursuing to um, to the gaming facility request for application gaming license three the such readoption to be filed with the Department of State uh, prior to the expiration of the current uh, emergency rule. Any questions for Rob or staff gathered there? Okay, so may I have a motion then to readopt the rules pertaining to gaming facility request for application and gaming facility license application. So moved. So moved. It's been moved. A second? Second. Great. Uh, any discussion on the motion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, the motion carries. The next item, Rob. Item 4B are proposed amendments to our thoroughbred out of competition testing rule designed to stylistically conform the thoroughbred and standard bread out of competition rules, clarify the existing rule, and to add improvements that conform with amendments to the standard bread out of competition rule that took effect on August 6, 2014. Relative to improvements, the proposed rule adds several new blood and gene doping agents, including cobalt. The proposal prohibits all substances that are capable of abnormally enhancing the oxygenation of body tissues. Uh, this is of particular import to safeguard the health of horses and the integrity of, to protect the integrity of racing. Commission staff recommends the proposal of these amendments to the thoroughbred out of competition testing rule. I want to mention that on the phone we have uh, Rick Goodell, one of the assistant counsels that works on rulemaking relative to the thoroughbred rules. We also have with us at the meeting here Dr. Scott Palmer, who also assisted in this. That's helpful. Any questions uh, on the proposed rulemaking regarding these, uh, the matter that as Rob outlined? Questions? Comments. Um, okay. Well, then I would entertain a motion uh, to adopt the proposed rulemaking on thoroughbred out of competition testing. Do I have a motion? So moved. Is there a second? 
Second. Great. The motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on the motion? Great. Then it'll call for a vote. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Our next uh, item on the agenda here is adjudications, and the Commission has two hearing officer reports uh, for consideration today, and we'll ask Mr. Williams to outline the two cases starting in the matter of Stephen Kasmar. Rob? On September 22, 2014, the Bureau of Licensing declined to license Stephen J. Kasmar as a totalizator employee for Thoroughbred and Harness Paramutual Wagering. The denial was based on the grounds that Mr. Kazmar made false statement on his license application. After Mr. Kazmar appealed, a hearing was conducted. The hearing officer's report and recommendation were delivered to the Commission Secretary on December 16, 2014. The hearing officer recommended that the license be granted. At a meeting conducted pursuant to the judicial or quasi-judicial proceedings exemption of the New York Public Officers Law, Section 108.1, the Commission considered this matter. Thank you. The Commission uh, duly deliberated and considered this matter and determined upon a unanimous vote to reject the hearing officer's report and recommendations uh, on the basis of represent representations made uh, on a license application uh, in violation of the Commission's rules. Next, Rob. On September 22, 2014, the Bureau of Licensing declined to license Graham Lewis as a harness racing trainer <laughs> driver. The denial was based on the ground that Mr. Lu grounds that Mr. Lewis's experience, character, and general fitness are such that his participation in racing or related activities would be inconsistent with the public interest, convenience, or necessity, or with the best interest of racing generally. After Mr. Lewis appealed, a hearing was conducted. Hearing officer's report and recommendation were delivered to the Commission Secretary on December 23, 2014. The hearing officer recommended that the license denial be upheld. The Commission duly deliberated and considered this matter and determined upon a unanimous 5-0 to zero vote uh, to sustain the hearing officer's report and recommendations. Okay, that concludes uh, adjudications. and. Um, before we get to any new business, if there is any, this given that this is the first meeting of 2015, and I regret I'm not there in person with you, but I think it's uh, timely to reflect on some of last year's articulated goals that we've been working on that I've um, prepared some comments on. First is the reform of the, of the hearing process, one consistent theme of our fellow commissioners discussed last year was the necessity to reform the hearing process. I think most of us expressed concern with the length that it took from the initial citation or the violation charge until a hearing officer's report and recommendation was uh, before this body for final agency action. And I think substantial uh, advances have been made. First, we issued a request for a quali uh, qualification for outside hearing officers. Uh, resulting in the engagement of four individuals, which has brought flexibility in the scheduling of hearings. We required hearing officer reports uh, to be submitted in a timely fashion, establishing a deadline for their completion uh, following the conclusion of an administrative hearing. We are also addressing a problem not just seen in New York, but at other jurisdictions around the country as well. We've taken important steps to prevent the gaming of the administrative hearing process. Uh, rural violators have long requested adjournment after adjournment until it was convenient for them to face a potential uh, suspension or other penalty. All participants in the administrative process tolerated these delays, and I'm pleased that we've started to make measures to uh, effectively eliminate their permissiveness. Uh, obviously, and of course, uh, there's process can always have refinement, and it continues. That just last month, several commissioners requested an adjustment in what uh, violations are actually appealable and asked staff to consider uh, and assess costs for unprosecuted appeals. And it's particularly uh, reflecting on this whole process, and I'd like to thank Commissioner Machetti and General Counsel Ed Burns and Assistant Counsel Rick Adell for their continued and, and diligent work uh, in this area. Um, secondly, drug rules. 
uh, a key tenet of our mission statement regards the health of race horses. Uh, strict regulation of drugs has long been a primary concern on the part of the commission and I'm proud that New York has the strongest equine drugs regulation in the nation and we all recognize the importance of the adoption of uniform uh, drug standards. I think we're all pleased that we have taken measures to ensure that New York continues uh, to lead the way while being consistent with other important national racing jurisdictions. Obviously, consideration of uniformity and adoption of other drug prohibitions remains important. Hence, our earlier consideration just this afternoon of yet another adjustment and a new drug prohibition proposal. Um, similarly, I would like to congratulate Assistant Counsel Rick Goodell and our equine medical director, Dr. Scott Palmer, for their leadership uh, in this important area. Which brings me finally to the equine uh, medical director and, and a final thought regarding uh, Dr. Palmer. The Commission's hiring of Scott Palmer as the equine medical director in and of itself was uh, arguably one of the most significant advances addressing equine health and safety. While I appreciate, I think we all do, the work, uh, his work regarding drug rules, that's only one small portion of his portfolio. It's my understanding that Dr. Palmer has been working on several important measures, including a statistical analysis of the epidemiological data collected from Naira racetracks and the development of a virtual stable software program that will enable the Commission automatically uh, notify a claiming trainer of corticosteroid injections reported on the Commission's Equine Steroid Administration log. Additionally, it's my understanding uh, from Rob and others that Dr. Palmer will be focusing on standardizing pre-race horse inspections with the intention of increased use of information and uh, technology. And I see that uh, Dr. Palmer is there in the room with us this afternoon. And so I, I would like to afford him uh, the opportunity to, to share a brief overview of, of his office uh, from the past year with our gratitude uh, for your considerable work. Dr. Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the inaugural year of the Office of Veterinary Affairs was defined in large part by creating the goals and objectives of this new office. After meeting with the Secretary of Racing from the Governor's Office, as well as the Dean of Cornell's College of Veterinary Medicine, the Executive Director of the Gaming Commission, and the CEO of Naira, I created a list of consensus priorities identified by these stakeholders and designed a strategic plan to address them. One of the top priorities was the creation of a comprehensive by a security plan for New York racetracks to prevent and limit the spread of infectious disease. I established a working group of veterinarians from Cornell University and the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets, and together we drafted a biosecurity toolkit with unique documents for racetrack operators, veterinarians, and horsemen. This biosecurity plan was successfully used four times during the year to manage outbreaks of contagious disease at New York racetracks with minimal interruption of racing throughout the state and in the region. Another top priority was reform of the New York State medication rules to embody the scope of the ARCI National Uniform Medication Rules. This has been accomplished in a collaborative effort with both thoroughbred and standardbred horsemen, veterinarians, and racetrack operators. The support of the commissioners in this area is very much appreciated. I've also been working with New York State Drug Testing and Research Laboratory to achieve accreditation by the Racing Medication and Testing Consortium and we instituted an aggressive out-of-competition testing program this past year to detect the administration of substances and drugs that could influence the outcome of a race, yet be undetectable by conventional race day testing. A third top priority was to perform a gap analysis of the recommendations of the New York Task Force on Racehorse Health and Safety. And I'm pleased to report that this process has moved forward with full cooperation of all relevant stakeholders. I would emphasize that this is not a checklist, however but rather an ongoing and meaningful commitment to equine, rider, and driver safety that requires consistent vigilance, <laughs> scheduled reviews, and adjustments of internal controls along the way. In a very real sense, it's a quality control process. The formation of the equine necropsy program at Cornell University and the equine safety review boards at Naira and Finger Lakes racetracks were important components of this process. Both of these efforts, I think, can be fairly characterized as works in progress. We have learned a great deal from the two years of data from the necropsy program that is currently undergoing scientific analysis and will be published. 
The commission has recently assumed administrative control of the Equine Safety Review Board and will continue to work with NIRA and the Finger Lakes racing officials to increase the effectiveness of the investigative process and the review board operations. Finally, in March of this year, PETA presented the commission with nearly eight hours of video and approximately 285 pages of written notes from an undercover investigation by PETA alleging multiple rule violations and widespread animal abuse by the Steve S. Mewson stable. This required the commission to undertake a comprehensive investigation of the circumstances surrounding the day-to-day -day operations of the S. Mewson stable, the care of their horses during the 2013 Saratoga Race Week meet, as well as some circumstances that had bearing on these complaints that occurred in other racing jurisdictions as well. This investigation is now complete and the report is currently in the final stages of review prior to presentation to the commissioners. In the coming year, I will address a number of new initiatives. From the internal perspective and in consultation with commission staff, I will create a series of internal controls for the Office of Veterinary Affairs in order to identify areas of exposure for the department and design appropriate interventions to address them. Externally, I will collaborate with the Jockey Club to create an online continuing education program for trainers and will propose rulemaking that will require completion of a defined number of hours of continuing education as a requirement for trainer licensure in 2016. I have created an, internal, an international working group of veterinary researchers and clinicians who will collaborate in the coming year to examine the occurrence of unexplained cardiac deaths at the racetrack. Expecting our examining veterinarians to identify horses that will sustain a catastrophic injury in a race with 100% accuracy by performing nearly 100 physical examinations in the morning hours each and every race day is, in practical terms, mission impossible. In the coming year, I will conduct a pilot study of the use of inertial motion sensor technology to provide an objective measure of soundness of these horses by examining veterinarians. And I will develop evidence-based recommendations to more accurately identify horses at increased risk of repetitive overuse injury. Finally, I will conduct a comprehensive review of all the circumstances surrounding winter racing at Aqueduct and will make additional recommendations to prevent the occurrence of another spike of injuries during the 2015 Aqueduct Fall and Winter Meets. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Doctor. Any follow-up questions or comments to Dr. Palmer from fellow commissioners? Well, relatedly, I would, as we look ahead, I'd invite any commissioner to take some time and reflect on any policy procedural objectives uh, that they would like to see considered in the upcoming year. I think we've heard certainly Dr. Palmer's re reflections, uh, uh, fulsome report from our executive director and some of the things coming up and looking back just in the past year. I'm grateful for the initiative in and around problem gambling, the hearing that we had uh, in Albany, uh, which continues to have relevance as we uh, move forward. Um, any new or old business to consider in the committee? We had Rob's report, uh, and we look to follow-ups as, as he uh, outlined as well. Uh, next, turning to um, scheduling of our next meeting, today's meeting, uh, uh, consistent with our practice, the next meeting is scheduled for February 23rd, uh, 2015. That would be the fourth Monday of the month. And again, we ask you to advise Ms. Buckley of your uh, availability. Any other matters, Rob? Anything else? Any oh. Not being in the room, I just want to make sure we're uh, getting everything done. OK, well, uh, that concludes our today's published agenda. Uh, and hearing nothing else, I this meeting of the New York State Gaming Commission is officially adjourned. Thank you all for, for joining us, and safe travels to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.